I'll take the next segment. So, um, we've had this debate on the show before. Actually, back up. I bought a DM2 uh, W. Um, oh, and yeah, yeah. I, uh, so, the Wazacraft version of the, the original boss analog delay. Um, I love that thing. Like, honestly, and I, and I know it's, you know, people are like, oh, it's Honeymoon or whatever. Um, I've always loved analog delays. I had a carbon copy for a while, um, which I liked. Uh, I liked that it had modulation on it. That was kind of a nice thing. I, I don't think I ever turned the modulation off, quite frankly. Um, but I always thought they were dark. You know, and then they came out with the carbon copy bright, but I thought the carbon copy bright was too bright. So, you know, I needed the Goldilocks. Uh, <laughs> I needed to find that one that was just right. And I think the DM2, even though it doesn't have modulation on it, because it's a big fat sounding delay, I think it's an ex I think it's kind of an acceptable substitute for my obsession with tape delay. Cause I never liked the tape delay sounds where the, the tapes were like worn out. I always liked the fresh tape sound in front of an amplifier, you know, that kind of thing was an option. Um so it's going on my board. I, I ordered a bunch of stuff to uh to mount it to my board. I got the you know, the whatever the one 28b plate that goes on the bottom of the boss pedals it's flat and all that and um i'm just getting i'm getting my board straightened out i'm getting all the pieces i need to put it together i'm cementing my board and i'm planning not to add anything to it for the remainder of the year um now i am not saying i'm not gonna buy anything and there's not gonna be anything new on my board in the next six months but i'm trying to make it difficult on myself because i have intentions long term of um upgrading to a slightly bigger board with a switching system on it um the i'm probably just going to do the es5 go cheap um just because i want to be able to control my amplifier channels um i've had some issues just playing around the house and hitting the fuzz on the wrong channel and like it sounds awful and i don't want to get into a situation where i'm doing that all the time live and it has to do with somewhat with my pedal board layout and some other pieces of that but um that's kind of the thought process is driving this decision. Um, so with that, and this is probably the more interesting part of this, um, I have some pedal board supplies, which I probably, you probably know about this stuff. If you've never built a, um, a pedal board before, I think this is good content. Um, so I have these guys, which are, Cable mounting yep. tie downs, and that should be able to autofocus. But if it doesn't, I have um, a whole bunch of those. Yep. Um, basically, they're adhesive on the back. These are not the, the you know the super nice marine ones, um, but I don't plan on doing a lot of marine touring, and I'm not world touring, not. so I think you should be fine. Um, and basically, you stick them to your board in a line or however you want to do it, and you zip tie your cables down. Now, I used to be the guy that was like, "Well, I don't want to zip tie them down. What if something goes bad? Then I'm going to have to pull everything off." Listen. When you can get on Amazon and you can buy – it's here somewhere. I did that too. Bought a big bag of little zip ties. Yeah, the the like the two-inch zip ties or whatever, four-inch zip ties. Yep. I bought a bag for like seven ninety nine. dollars I got a 1,000 of them. I was literally putting yep. them on and cutting them off the other day while I was working on it because I'm like, yep. we just want to get it tied down so that everything runs in the correct way. And I realized like I'm running my board with the patch cables from the board prior – so I don't really actually have the right lengths. And so I said, I'm, I'm going to have to make new cables. Um, now, granted, we, we talked about, so I have actually sitting on my desk because I've been going through bins. Um, Soldered and solderless. Solderless cables, right? These are George L's. And this is a popular option for people who have not built a ton of boards and are not really comfortable with a soldering iron. Um, there are reasons why you might not want to use this, and I'll go over that in a minute. But... Um, Basically, I am going soldered again. I'm using uh, Mogami 2319, and uh, I'm going to square plugs, so I actually ponied up and got nice plugs um, because I'm planning on keeping this board for quite some time. Um, and so the reason why what, – what, what I really wanted to talk about with regards to this is um, – so George Ellis Cable, right? I don't have the capacitance sitting in front of me at the moment. I could look it up. Um, this cable is really, really bright. And I've had conversations with show listeners and other people, and I, I'm not going to dispute what they say, but I'm, but I will, I will point out this is bright cable. You can cut the ends off this 
you can actually use this cable with an existing plug, solder it on, and you're going to have a damn bright cable. It's going to be very high fidelity. Um, it's going to be kind of clunky because this, this stuff's like, it, it's, I don't know if you can see that. It's really thin, but it's like, it holds its shape real well. It's actually kind of hard to run on a board. Like a lot of people bend it while they're putting it together and it's not solid core, um, which I cut. I actually sacrificed some to find out because uh, I was having a conversation about that with somebody. But um, people talk about cable and uh, this is this is uh, going back to Rig Doctor. He talks about and, and also Paul Rivera in the video talked about you want to use soldered cables if you're going to be touring in any sort of environment where you're going to have air, you know, liquid corrosion kind of stuff anything that's going to be exposed to the air basically but here's the deal so i i tend to agree with them um if you if you want a solid connection like where you can't break it and it can stand up a lot more abuse with with good um uh tension on the you know on the plug itself and stuff so that so that the the wire is not moving around and pulling on the uh, the leads as they're attached to the uh the grounds and you know, the connection. Um, yeah, solder. Wait, that's the way to go. Um, but they, they say, well, it's not gas tight. When I hear that, I cringe. And I'll explain why. Um, I'm in the telecom field. I'm, I'm IT guy, right? So I've been doing wiring installations for companies for a long time for digital signal cables. It's much smaller wire, stranded, usually, sometimes solid core. And do you know that all of your telephone equipment is usually terminated without solder? I mean, it's punch down block. Uh-oh. It's two pieces the of metal that go like this and accept the wire and then close on it. Okay, I can tell you this from coming from uh, National Telecom. Yeah. That same, is a fact thing. from your home, from the back mm-hmm. of your phone. And remember the old wired phones? Yeah. To the all the way through your house to the what we call the NID or the network interface device, which is where you were responsible and we were responsible, all the way back to the next tie point, to the next tie point, to the switch. The only place that's soldered is in the actual it, um, anyone who knows what the switching equipment looks like, the OE or operating equipment that controlled your line your specific lines. You had your own card, okay? That's the only solder point you had. For some people, 12, 15 miles. <laughs> so <clears throat> to say that you can't control um, <laughs> your guitar signal from, I don't know, you know, 14 feet away, <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're okay. I, you, you know, you don't have squirrels chewing on it or freaking... <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so, so that's what I was going to say. So like, yeah, are they right? Yes, they're absolutely right. Like the biggest thing, the biggest problem in telecom is corrosion, right? Yep. And, and specifically salt corrosion. You get in the yep. spring, those guys are so damn busy fixing like downed wire, basically under, oftentimes under the ground or, you know, up on a pole somewhere, maybe up on a tower that it's like, yeah, I see. I, I, I totally understand and respect their opinion on this. But I also think that those are totally and vastly different circumstances where that stuff holds up really freaking well. And I want to point out something else. Stranded cable. We just mentioned that, right? That's not a gas type connection. You can get corrosion anywhere, including on your solder joint. So why in the yeah. hell would it make a difference if it's on this end of the electrical system, this end of the electrical system, this part of the electrical system, or this end of the electrical system, corrosion is corrosion. It doesn't matter. That's right. It doesn't matter. That's absolutely right. And so, I mean, I get it. You want it because some jackass could pull on your soldered cables real hard and pull the tips off if they're, if they're you know, pulling them with a truck. Um that could be a problem, but you're not going to like a mechanical connection like solder is going to be tougher than that. And that's basically what it's about, right? It's about stability here, not necessarily the corrosion as much, which is what I was. This one, I've been trying to articulate this for weeks because I've been thinking about it and I'm like, I'm totally 
fine and comfortable saying I'm happier with soldered cable only because I have I have more control over my sound, but also because I know they're a little bit more bulletproof. Just a little bit. Because I've had, so like, not cables like this, because I don't use these anymore, but I've had uh, patch cables go bad live. Or you get to a gig and you think they're bad because you made them yourself and you're like, oh, shit. And you start pulling things and running all these different cables trying to figure out what's going on. And, of course, I explained on, the, on that one episode, like, that ended up happening. Excuse me. <coughs> that ended up happening to me. And what I, what it ultimately resulted in was um, me realizing I had the volume knob turned down on my king of tone. Um, so it wasn't passing signal. It wasn't the cable at all. Which... So I also bought a cable tester um, to do all this stuff. And um, all told, so to get into making your own cables, you're going to spend some money. You're going to buy solder iron, 30 bucks, 40 bucks to all the way up to whatever you want to spend. Um, and then your cable supply. So to do my board, I'm, I'm making, I bought this stuff to make 14 cables. Um, some right angle, some straights, just whatever works best for the given situation. Um, which is probably more than I need, but I wanted to have a little bit of extra scrap also just to have them around in case I need them. Um, and, uh, for, and power. So I'm doing power too this time. This is the first time I've made DC cables, but I'm tired of dealing with. So if you've bought a power supply, Jim, I know you've got a power supply. You get those one size fits all cable and you end up with like five extra inches for like half your pedals or you yep. end up with the, the or you want one that's straight across your entire board. <laughs> it's like, seriously, this cable costs less than a nickel a foot. And you're telling me that you can't give me an extra four inches. I would rather them give me long ones than give right. me short ones. And anyway, yep. they never give you. So like Voodoo Lab, they give you all their uh, they give you like four corner corner jack ones and then they give you like four straight ones and then the corner jack ones are a different length than the straight ones and then like they also give you all these like miss you know mic, uh, like mishmash of other cables and then you can buy additional cables direct from voodoo lab and i'm thinking i'm looking at the prices number one and i'm going holy crap you know these are not that expensive and on top of that they're not going to be the right damn length I'm going to end up with a 24 inch, you know, not nine volt cable for a pedal. that's only eight inches away, like kind of deal and or, and or vice versa. I'm going to have to get the nine inch cable for the pedal. That's like 18 inches away. Um, and it just doesn't like it, it ends up just making everything a mess. So I have like four pedal boards worth power supplies worth of cables laying around. And I still was struggling to find the right connectors and connections so I said, screw it. I'm wiring my own power because I said at this point I can buy soldered DC jacks and I can have them perfectly aligned. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, there's some other tips that I can give people. Um, number one is like, you know, you talk about power supplies. Not all power supplies are created equal. You definitely want to get something that's isolated. Uh, I would look for a switching supply. That seems to be the standard these days. Uh, even Voodoo Labs new new uh, power supplies are, are switching or they use some different fancy form of a transformer because the transformers put off electromagnetic interference and in certain cases it's going to cause problems uh, I have never and, and Jim you know I've owned probably a hundred pedals at this point I've never had a pedal that was that was uh, prone to magnetic interference but apparently it's a thing and some people bitch and complain and say, you shouldn't buy a Voodoo Lab Pedal Power Plus 2 because it has a transformer in it. Listen, lots of people use those for a really long time without ever caring whether it had a transformer in it. Now, some people got pissed because they take them overseas and then somebody put 240 volts through them and fry them. And that's why they went to the switching supplies. That's really the reason. Okay. If there was no no different power overseas, they would be running all of this stuff on the same transformers they already were. Um, it's the same thing as the the uh, the amp one. He designed that with a switching power supply because he knew it was going to be subjected to all kinds of different voltages. 
Uh, w- w- you bought you bought one of those. Did they give you the other adapters for for uh, foreign countries? Yeah, I figured they would, because that was like part of the selling point. Yeah. So you use a regular IEC mains in, and then the other end there's an adapter that goes into the wall that adapts you to whatever power you're plugging into. Yep. Um, now, so power supply, all that stuff. Another thing that's been said to me is don't put your power supply underneath your board uh, because apparently it orients your transformer underneath the pedal. Like you might put pedals directly on top of it. God forbid, because what does everybody do, right? They get their, and, and I, <laughs> Rig Doctor talks about this. Mason from Vertex talks about this. He says, put, you know, be careful because if you put your power supply underneath your board, you're going to be mounting pedals right on top of it. So inevitably, what does he do in every single video? He puts the power supply underneath a riser, and then he puts pedals on top of it. And I'm going, is that riser an adequate shield? You know what I mean? Like, it's not a Faraday cage, buddy. It's the same shit. Um, I, or, or my personal favorite is the, uh, well, you know, you don't have to separate your, your power and your uh, audio cable. No, you really don't. In, in, in practice, you really don't. But should right. you? I mean, science says yes, because especially if you have transformers, you're going to have electromagnetic fields carried by any of the DC coupling cables that are used. So theoretically, if you already have a problem with a transformer on your board, you probably shouldn't be running those cables right on top of one another. Just saying. Um, and it doesn't take much to actually isolate them on a cable that size passing that kind of voltage. It could be a centimeter apart. Um, and actually what I do just because I'm anal, actually the real reason I do it, I'll, I'll explain the real reason I do it. Cause it has nothing to do with voltage, but so one of these guys, I put power on one side, audio on the other, and we tie them down to one rail a piece. Yeah. What's the problem? And then co- cross everything in 90 degrees, just like you do in a music studio. When you build something in a music studio and you want low noise, that's what you do. You cross all your power at 90 degree to your audio. And preferably, if you can get away with it, you find a way to route your power cables so they're always one foot away from your audio cables. That's why people don't realize those racks are so deep. Why are the units that go in them only this big? Because they're routing the power a foot away from it and then dropping it down and dropping the signal cables right off the back of the unit so they never touch. That's why. Um, just little things that, that I know that I've seen in my travels that just like irritate me because people are like, no, there's no science behind that. Nobody does that. For, you know, Listen, people have been doing it for 50 years in music studios. I think somebody figured something out at some point along the path. Uh, I don't think people do go to great lengths to do things like that unless there's something behind it. Um, can you make records if you run your cables together? Sure. Sure. Can you, will your rig sound good if you run your cables together? Maybe. Probably. Pro- I got to say probably because I do it all the time. But um, I'm going to do it right. And if I'm going to take the effort to do it right, I'm going to do it right. I'm literally going to go as far as I can, balls to the wall, like sonically the best way it should be um and if somebody told me well you know the white noise is generated by your power supply uh and the cables in proximity to your audio cables will make everything sound bigger and more 3d and it was true i'd be like hell yeah let's do it um doesn't matter to me uh but i just and i'm not speaking from experience on this stuff i'm just speaking from what i've read i know that i we have we have a local pedal, pedal builder here pedal board builder here who's who's really damn good and uh he would probably tell he would probably laugh at some of the things that i'm saying because because he like he's like it's just in practice it doesn't mean anything that's like, i'm gonna do it you know um why wouldn't i go all the way you know i wouldn't just try to do it to make it faster um <laughs> yeah it, so you know if you're gonna, if anything's worth doing it's worth doing it right it's kind of my mentality and i know that's probably I'm sure there's some people like, just get it done quick and dirty. And that's fine. Um, and if you've got those kind of gigs where like, <laughs> shit, you're gigging three nights a week and you got to put your pedal to b- pedal board together the day of the gig. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. You know, bur- burn the, uh, the the candle at both ends and get it done. But uh, in my situation, it's kind of like, I got the luxury to do this, so I'm gonna. Um, there's a lot of myths. 
Jim. I mean, I guess that's what I'm what I'm pointing out there. I'm sure a lot of this stuff you, maybe you never even thought about because um, well, yeah, you got a couple boards now. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that that you got to remember when it comes to bleeding frequencies is it's got to be pretty high frequency. Sure. So you know about as much as about a twisted pair as I do. Um, the cable that they use to send your guitar down, not likely to to go over. Now that said, that possibly the power could if it's got if it's got AC riding on the DC power. Right, um, right. You can, or a bad ground in a pedal or something like that. You'll yep. have to have something wrong in the system for there to be a real issue. Right. So, but would I sit there and wrap them together? <laughs> no. <laughs> I would I would run them apart anyway, but... Well, the, re- um, the real reason to run them apart, and this is what I, I neglected to mention, the real reason to run them apart is so that when I have to troubleshoot on my board, if I, if I look at my board and I go, this pedal's not lighting up, right. then I go... It's cut about the, power. Cut the power about. lines and replace the power cable instead yeah. of, oh shit, I have to cut all the cables off my board and find the one yeah. that's bad. You right. know what I mean? Like, it, it would yep. be better to have them separate just for that reason alone. I um, go the extra length of actually color coding the two ends mm-hmm. of power. Um, I do that too. I don't need, label them. Yeah, I don't need to do that to the to the the audio cable because it's obvious that. Typically, it's going to be the pedal next to it, or I'm going to know if it was weirdly done. So that's not a problem. The The thing that um, I like to do, personally, is I like to run, um, uh, you know, I'll use this little, it's just this little piece of electrical tape, literally, and I have seven or eight different colors, and I color code them. And then just like in a resistor, if I have... To have two reds, I just put a black ring with a marker around the two ends of one of them. And then, you know, because that's how resistors, you know. Yeah, right, right, right. You know, you use color coding on a resistor to see. That system Um, is such a nightmare. Yeah, (laughs) and it is. But this way I know, okay, that one's feeding this one and that, you know, so on and so forth. So, but, we, you know, I think we have a similar um, way of looking at that. Um, um go ahead. there was so there was another piece of this um so along with the power and flexibility and understanding that like something breaks the good reason to keep your solderless cables once you've graduated out of these guys is if something breaks because if you have 10 foot of this in your bag and two ends yep. click, you click. can cut a cable and you can just zip tie it right on the top of the board or something and get through the gig. And they're flexible and they're small, so at least it's not a horrendous fix. But in a pinch, okay. Um, I have hundreds of dollars worth of George L's leads, like the the ends and stuff. In fact, I totaled them all up. I was going to sell them at one point. I haven't sold them yet. I am going to sell them. Um, and I will put them up in the group when I do. Uh, I would still be using George L's for certain applications. Like if I was a country player, cause I'd want all that treble. Uh, yeah. George L's man. Uh, I even just the cable is like gold for that. I, I, I have never used a cable. that is as bright as George L's. And it was borne out in the capacitance numbers when I evaluated, uh, what cable I was going to move to. So I was looking at Mogami and I was looking at Belden, Canary and Gotham. And they all make different products, but I was looking at a, different, a couple of different varieties. And I went with Mogami um, because it has uh, a warmer sound because the capacitance bears it out. And actually it does. It's a much fatter sounding cable because there's no trouble to it. It rolls off a lot of it. It's not as bad as a coily cable. <laughs> uh, not in any way. But you'll definitely, if you run 10 feet of it on your board, you're going to notice. Um, it's definitely a... Uh, warmer sound than what I was getting to George L's with 10 feet of George L's on my board. Um, and in fact, I did, uh, I did a B test and I never posted the results, um, because I didn't think that there was enough there to even care about for most people. It wouldn't have been cause I only did like two feet. Um, there really wasn't that much difference in the two feet. Uh, I know, and I've talked about maybe doing it where I'll take 10 feet 
and show the difference because 10 feet is probably on average what people most people are running on their board um and you and you can bear you can definitely hear it i i, I mean i can hear it out of the the tube but i don't think most people would be like he's holding the pick differently or something and it's like not really because i played it through a looper <laughs> you know it's like um and i used the same cable to run it into the looper so um i don't know it's a whole thing and you could actually there are other people that have done testing like that paul rivera talked about in the video he's like yeah, we, we did testing, and he talked about a couple of different cable solutions they were using. They were using a ham radio cable at one point. Um, and I think one of the other ones was like uh, some sort of telephone cable, um, which which is not RJ, you know, 45 style cable, but it was like some other specific, specific telephone cable. And, um, you know, it, it really just comes down to this. What works for you? Um making sure that it's solid and rock solid, right? Routing your cables in a way that makes sense to you and um, just getting it done. I mean, so like I've done it enough times now, this board's going to look really good when it's done. In fact, I think I sent you pictures of my previous board. Maybe I'll pop them up in the um, podcast here. Uh, the board that, as it currently stands right now, I had that routed exceptionally well for having excess cable and stuff. Uh, so, I mean, I would not even bat an eye about taking that to a gig the way it is right now. So anyway, that, that's, that segment. I'm, I've had enough talking about, uh, uh, things that are probably going to get me in trouble with, with various people because, uh, <laughs> I, I'd speak with many, hey, some many <laughs> show listeners. I have friends who are devotees of solderless. And I have friends that are devotees of soldered cable. And I have heard many weird things from both sides, which is really funny because I'm kind of in the middle and I'm like, I'm the only one sitting here going, it's just capacitance, guys. It's just capacitance. The sound of a solderless cable is capacitance versus a soldered cable. It's just capacitance. There's literally no other difference except for reliability if you're putting your board through hell. Um, and... To put it in perspective, for the people that say that solderless is horrible and it's, you know, the devil and should be wiped from the face of the earth and, you know, expunge. Here. One of my local shops, they build boards for people. There are over 100 boards in service that they have done that remain in service, most of them, um, unless the user decides to change pedals out or goes to somebody else and gets it done, that were done with George L's. And... To my knowledge and to their knowledge, there haven't been any failures. So it is what it is. I mean, sure, is it less reliable? Absolutely. It's that's I mean, that's like a fact. But the reality is how less reliable is it? That's a good question. Exactly. Yep. That's a good question. Um common sense tells us we shouldn't do it, but you know, common sense it's common sense tells us we should not build our uh, build our power grid and electric grid. Or not our power grid, our uh, telephone community electric telephone communication grid on punch down blocks, but we do it anyway. You know when you're you know when you're like um have you ever been in an area where your utilities suck, Jim, and like there's constantly problems with the phones and stuff, and then like you call them. Out. I had this happen. I had a client that was in an area that was notoriously bad, a town called Franklin Park, um, and uh, all of the telecom lines and stuff were laid in, like the. 40s and 50s and most of it had not been updated at all so they had um and this is not that long ago so this is kind of embarrassing you had a t1 with uh like one meg down or some stupid bad number like that and they were running an entire organization on this uh, no one meg t1 yeah with like 30 okay. 30 people in the office or some shit with like a one meg t1 and um yeah. And there it was divided. Some of it was voice. So it was divided. It wasn't even a full T1. Um, and so this whole thing was like, it's just, it was just a nightmare, right? And they had, they had internet problems constantly. Internet would go completely down. I'd go upstairs. I'd kick the Adtran, which was their, uh, their T1 modem. I would, I would pull the plug and restart it, which I'm not supposed to do. And then we, we actually found out where their, their DMARC card was. 
which was in their building. It was in their factory downstairs, underneath the stairs by a, um, a slop sink. Quite normal for some reason. Oh, yeah, because they just put it wherever the fuck they want it. Like, y- you know that. I mean, I, I, it's just like, here, we'll just put it next to this water heater. Yep. That sounds like a good idea. Like, yep. who who authorized you to put it there? So I actually convinced them to move it. This is a client of mine. I convinced them to move it. They put it upstairs. Next tech comes out. He sees it upstairs. He's moving it downstairs back to where it was. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? He brought it. He brought in a new cage to hold the, the cards. And I'm like, I just sat there and I shook my head. I was like, this is this is about par for the course, right? But um, they told me one time they came out. And they had the panel off the wall and I could see all the punch down block inside and they had all the tags for all the different neighbors and stuff and uh, whatever, you know, lines that were connected outside. And he was just, he was just pulling the lines out and I'm going, D- people are connected to those. He's like, who gives a shit? I'm like, uh, okay. And he was basically saying like, the, the, people on the, the, lines, in this a- the lines in this neighborhood are so bad. He's like, we just redo them when we open these boxes up. And and he was like, uh, he was telling me like, he pulled, he showed us our line. There was like, I mean, you could see visible rust on it. And he's like, yeah, we're gonna replace this. You're gonna get your, you're gonna get the guy next doors. And then when he complains, their their people are gonna come out, and then they're gonna swap it for the guy next door. <laughs> you know, and it's just gonna be this big like, everybody's gonna be swapping it until they finally come out and lay new cable. And yeah. I just sat there and I just put my head in my hands, and I was like, I was really young at the time. I was probably like 25 years old. So we call just, it swapping pairs. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly what it they're doing. Normal. And they'd come out and they'd do it every three months. Something would happen mm-hmm. and every three months they'd come out and swap pairs. And I know Until sometimes somebody, we were getting swapped, which is why well, all, you, we were getting, all you've got to do is contact the SEC and say, this has got to end. We need because believe it or not, they want to do the right thing. The problem is budget. But when the SEC says to do it, now they can go to the state and they can say, hey, we need to do this because they might, they might need right of way because they might need to pull cable through some new, new uh, conduit or whatever. And in our state, it, it, there's, there's a, a whole lot in our state. There's a lot of issues with that because our state's very corrupt. And yeah, so you could I call know. the SEC and they would just be like, <laughs> you're in Franklin Park. You're screwed. Yeah. You know, like we're not I'll touching you, that with a 10-foot pole. So – um, one of the things, like a lot of people will not know, I, I'm going to tell you a couple of little secrets from the inside. So one is the reason the AT and T was first to um, market with 4G was because they paid everybody else to keep their fiber dark. Yeah. And the funny part of the funnier part of it is the fiber they rode to their towers belonged. To the other companies. Yeah. Like in your area, it's there's Metro something. <laughs> Metrocom. And, uh, we, yeah. Yep, Metrocom. <laughs> and we had some. Verizon had some. And um, and then, of course, AT&T had some. Believe it or not, Metrocom and us provided as much fiber as they did. <clears throat> um, the, uh, uh, the other side of it is that uh, um, uh, th- that when it comes to that, so let's say – You'll you'll go to your neighbor like I, I don't know what your situation is, but let's say you have a um, you have a block of houses. Yeah. And you might have street A that's parallel to street B mm-hmm. that the, the 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 houses literally meet with a rear fence. Yeah. <clears throat> street A has fiber and coax um, cable. I've run into um, this. And the other one doesn't. Uh-huh. And you're like. Can't I get fiber? Because now I'm, I'm literally stuck in a monopoly. No, no, you can't. Because what happens is, again, like you said, the cable company pays off the, you know, the the local politicians to say, hey, don't let those fiber guys through here, and we'll do it. We'll word it in such a way that it looks like it's because we're saving some freaking rare squirrel or some dumb shit like that. When in reality, their freaking lines are running right through there. There's a piece of conduit already there. The fiber, which releases absolutely no EMI because it's fiber, which is glass and light. <clears throat> um, <laughs> that doesn't do anything. Novel concept. <laughs> How about that? Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's it, 
when I had to go through that stuff, because um, I lived in what they call facilities, and I also did uh, uh, what they call in, inside network. And I'll tell you, some of the stuff I went through to just get 10 feet of F and cable between two, because oftentimes, like the Twin Towers were a prime example. They were towns, cities of, in, in, among themselves in a in a weird way it's a it, it, it you can't really call them city because yeah but they had like the way they were set up is like they have this giant room in the basement where all the cable yep. terminates and like actually was all the way up yeah and sometimes yeah sometimes it's at the top <laughs> too like yeah yeah they had their own switches and uh you know and so not all the way up but quite a ways <clears throat> um but so they had their own switching they had their own networks they had their own um you know stuff that we fed from the main switching, but there, that's normal in a large place. I've yeah, we had that in our the, building too. Yeah, main the, the the size of literally a town or or a city, because they've got several thousand phone lines um, and you know faxes and of course T ones, T threes, um, OC, you know forty eights, OC one twenty. I mean, <clears throat> we could go on and on. Um, so uh, that that's a you know, it's a thing that that a lot of people don't appreciate. But you get down to what does I got to do with guitar gear, and it's this: a lot of people who who engineer at this level are forgetting that guitar is pretty guard darn simple. There's yeah. some wires. You live within what two? A much to, smaller band of what you deal two with to when you deal with this K, other stuff. Yeah, right? I mean. It's just not that much. We've only got the audible frequencies that matter. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, telecoms all over short. the place. I mean, they, they yeah. use every available avail available amount of bandwidth they can squeeze through a through a cat six. I mean, it's crazy. Oh, yeah. Um, actually, I was going to share as it applies to guitar. So this is a this is a standard that actually happens in the, the um, telecom community. You're not supposed to run Cat Five or Cat Six within a foot of fluorescent lighting. Yep. Now, unless you're in a really fancy office building where they actually hang a plenum that the cable yep. sits in, and that plenum has been designed to be a foot away from the fluorescent lights, I am yeah, willing to guarantee you <laughs> your building is not spec. Nope. And do you have network problems? Ask yourself that. Do you have network problems that are like? Yeah you know, indicative of just network, like general network mischief, because uh, it's be like drop packets and things like that. Probably not. Exactly. In fact, I had many, many clients where I would come out and they'd work on their network and I never took a look at their wiring until something blew up. And then it was like, yeah, we probably should rewire this for you because you guys, whoever did your wiring, just ran them right over the fluorescent lights up there, which is a fire hazard too. But, um, but it's like people seem to think that guitar equipment and gear and signal routing and all that stuff is like because it, it's their hobby. They get really, really freaky about it. You know, it's like, my God, I have to use this, you know, this this five hundred dollar Mogami cable with gold plugs. It's like, guys, wait a minute. Do you think anybody in the 60s was using a five hundred dollar Mogami cable with gold plugs? And get, that's the sound you're after. Like, what the hell are you on? Um, and also, like like I just said, it doesn't really matter what the spec says because there's just differences. I can tell you this. This cable, even though I said it was really bright and it's all capacitance, it does have a frequency curve to it. And, mm -hmm. it, and like the mid-range will be different from cable to cable, regardless of the top end. And you can hear that. So I, I want to... I wanna, kind of back things up a little bit i i can talk to him blue in the face about like you know is this a solderless solder versus solderless conversation no it's not really it's more about just finding what works for you and doing it in a way that makes sense rather than i've seen so many flat boards with people using hosa cables and like hosa cables okay so depends on the hosa cable because the cheap hosa cables are awful some of the more expensive ones are okay, but you're going to end up with all this extra shit to deal with that you don't want to deal with. So spend the extra five bucks 
Yeah. There, I, Jim, <clears throat> um, as we close this out, we're going to leave with, with this in mind. Ernie Ball, um, there's another company that's making flat patch cables. Those are great. Um, mm-hmm. but Ernie Ball makes them as well. You can get Pancake Jack cables from pretty much every company under the sun um, nowadays. And uh, even just simple right angle jacks are fine. That's uh, that's an Ernie Ball. Yep, that's an Ernie Ball. You can get a three pack of these, super cheap, cheaper than yeah, they're like and bucks. the wireless flat. It's definitely cheaper yeah. than what I'm going to make. Yeah, one hundred percent. So, um, yeah. So you know, just buy some decent damn cables. Uh, yep. I I will say this: I've had my negative experiences with solderless cable vis-a-vis friends and stuff who've had like lava cable and it's cheaper than George L's. Well, George L's was the first on the scene, right? George L's (laughs) is premium stuff. They got people like Eric Johnson backing them up and they went Um, out and they, you know, Oh yeah. So now there's lava cable, which is like $2 cheaper total per cable. You know, it's like guys, it's $2. I it's $2. uh, So, I, I had a little. I, I'll. I'd like to dovetail on your cable thing. I was yeah. at the store. I was at Guitar Center uh, waiting for my lesson, and uh, this guy comes in. He goes, "Oh, that's really funny. Eighteen point six feet." And he goes, uh, "Geez, they can't give me one more foot, or you know." And I'm like, "There's a reason it's eighteen point six feet. Because it's three inches extra goes, on either end." What? He goes, "Why?" I said, because that's where you start to get high end loss. So if you have 18 point or, or if you have um, 17 feet, you're going to notice the loss for sure. So 18.6 is where ah, they can safely yeah. go. OK, we're not going to have signal loss. Um, I never thought about I never cable. thought about that on those particular pieces. But you're absolutely right. Um, I've yeah. actually seen situations where they will. They will – so, like, this is not a good example because the right angle, like, literally terminates right there. But they'll right. say – let's say this is an 8-inch cable, and they will yep. measure the quarter-inch jack. Yes. <laughs> and say yep. that's, you know, part of the, that's part part of the of measurement. The, <laughs> it's like, yep, it's not really 18.6. It's only 18. The other three inches are yeah. inside the quarter-inch And that's <laughs> right. And that's – yeah. And so the guy goes – and I said, that includes the tips. And yeah. the guy goes, is that real? And uh, everybody was like, yeah, yeah, it's real. As a matter of fact, um, uh, I know that that uh, uh, Brian Wampler did a whole show on talking mm-hmm. about how you have signal loss. He goes, he goes I don't re- recommend cables much longer than 18 feet as a result. So he likes to keep his his under 16 feet. It, ha- it has to do oh. with uh, the capacitance again. So yep. at a certain length of, you know, you have more roll off in a specific range based on the certain length of footage. And there's a... There's a number you can use, but but the vast majority of guitar cable will go 18 feet, and then you'll start yep. to have signal loss after 18 feet. So everybody who goes to the store and buys 20 foot cables, because everybody does it, right? I have probably five 20 foot cables, and the reality is, I've already shot myself in the foot, right? If I'm looking for every p- bit of information coming out of my guitar, um, really anything over 10 foot. I've shot myself in the foot because at that point, there's so much capacitance that you're losing something. You may not be able to audibly hear it, but you're losing stuff. Right. And now those country guys. Yeah. And a lot of those country guys, that's the first place they're going to notice it Mm -hmm. is that high end um, because that's what they get. Well, if they can Um, still hear it. (laughs) There, there, there is definitely a questionable thing. I mean, let's face it. There's always that questionable um, point um, that is it really worth the argument when it comes to, uh, you know, live performance versus what I hear on stage and blah, 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 blah. And I look at it this way because we're coming up on our hour. Yeah. Well, let's so, let's let's do one more 15 minute segment and I already know what we're going to talk about. Well, go ahead. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm going to say this. Even if you can hear it, and, and it should, there's, there's, there's two things to think about. There's one, it sh- the sound you hear on stage should inspire you to play. I know this. If I can't hear my guitar, I can't play. 
Okay. And I, and maybe that's just me. I know some people, they play mechanically. I can't do it. I have to play audibly. And yes. uh, I was, I was telling my guitar instructor last week, we were sitting in the room and he goes, Jim, you, you, I play something, you play it. I play it, you play it. And I said, yeah, but that's because I can hear you play it. And then I respond to it and I, I could, he goes, because you sometimes play something different. And some, I go, well, sometimes I'm doing columns response. Sometimes I'm just trying to figure out what you did and can I do it differently because my fingers are smaller or, you know, um, I'm not com as comfortable because you're playing a different guitar than I am. And so that's, uh, and I've been trying to keep playing the same guitar each time. So I bring, I bring Pearl each time to, to keep that um, steady. Um and it, I think it helps each time you go and you and you learn the feel, the, the, that feel. So that's part of it. The other part of it is there's the other person that will say, well, the audience doesn't hear the difference. So here's what I say, whatever you want. That's what it should be. Whatever you want. If you want that high end, if you hear it, if you miss it and it helps you, then do it. If it. Does if you want to, you know, the, the audience thing, then do that. But don't put somebody down because it's not what you think is the right way to go. That's what I'll say. Yeah, not yeah. you. I don't think you would do that. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about anyone that's that is that would do that. I don't think that 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 it's fair. We've said know. this on the show before. It comes from another podcast, Six Is Like Hum. There are things that are appropriate <laughs> or inappropriate for a given situation, <clears throat> and that's what that falls into. Is it's a subjective thing. That's um, right. As much as people will try to make it not subjective, it's subjective. Unfortunately, yep. it is subjective, and I will stand by that. I may not stand by, you know, comments I've made about solderless cable before in the past, but I will stand by, I will stand by the fact that all things in guitar are subjective. Um, to the degree in which they are subjective, that's questionable, but um, they are all subjective because you will find people out there that will prefer something, even though it's not technically the correct thing to do so it is what it is 